I was going to let them eat their food, you know what I'm saying? Because we're going to have that little video thing, and then they can move up. That way they won't, we won't have rice. On <laughs> we do have mice here. Okay, I think we are ready. I want to thank all of you who've come today. This is part two of microaggressions in the workplace. I want to thank each of the panelists who are willing to show up again, <laughs> because we know everybody has a lot of other things to do. What I'd like to start with, and that'll allow you to spend a little bit of time kind of eating your food, and then after you get to eat your food, I'm going to make you come closer. Um, I'd like to start again with Daryl Wing Sue. Um, as I told, and I think almost everybody, how many were here last time? Okay, we have a few who aren't here. So those of you who were here last time, I believe that I threw out a challenge, and that challenge was that Portland Public Schools, everybody who's an employee is a part of a, a large team of people who are charged with educating our children and supporting our families. So how many of you who are here made an effort to kind of look around, see somebody who works for Portland Public Schools and just kind of go up and talk to them just because you could? Good. Would you tell us about that experience, please? I don't know that I've done anything different. So, so it's just kind of natural for you. But that's good. Keep it up. Anybody else who was here last time who made an effort to get somebody that ordinarily they, uh, to talk to somebody that ordinarily they would not? I can't tell you how important it is that we do that. We have less money. There are, because we are all coming from different backgrounds, whether it's racial, cultural, language, uh, neighborhood, where we're born, our faith, whatever it is, we have a lot of differences and we make a lot of assumptions about who people are and what they believe. My thesis is the only way that we can do more with less is for us to be able to actually meet other people, whether it's the custodian or it's the superintendent or it's all of the people in between. We're all a part of a bigger team. And even if my job is being a custodian, I have something to bring to the table. I may have kids in the school. I may have had experiences. And when I get to talk those through, I learn better how to, first I learn about myself, but then I learn also better how to give other people the benefit of the doubt. And I'll cite one thing that happened to me. There was a particular principal who got into a bit of hot water. And I was kind of irritated because I had to go out to the school. And I didn't. I know of the principal, but I don't know the principal. And I kind of had some preconceived notions. I was going to go out there and straighten the person out. And I talked to a colleague, Dunya, and she says, I know her, and I know enough about her to know that what you're thinking isn't right. She changed my attitude. And when I went out there, I was able to hear the story and realize that if I had gone out with my attitude, I could have done some things that would cause us not to be speaking and thought I was dead right. When I went out there with an open attitude, trying to figure out what really happened, I realized the principal was trying to do the job that the principal was charged with doing. And the person who had complained had a misunderstanding, had a sense of urgency. During the hours of 7.30 to 4.30, the principal's being a principal. My job is to make sure my children are safe, getting educated, Etc. If you have something about the school that you don't like and it doesn't really refer to keeping my kids safe, then we need to delay it. And there's Dunya. Dunya was the one who helped me. <laughs> what I'm sharing Dunya with, no, what I'm sharing with them is that we have preconceived notions about who people are and what they believe. And they're totally unfounded sometimes. And we need to own it. I mean, I had a lot of junk in my trunk. And when I kind of told Dunya, she said, wait a minute, hold up. I know her. I know her. And that's what I'm asking you to do. Get to know one another. We're different, we're strange, we're weird, according to other people. But the more we reach out, the more we'll find we do have commonalities. And we have one thing in common. If we work for Portland Public Schools, every single one of us is responsible for getting to know one another so we work seamlessly to serve our students, 
and to serve our families. And so to the extent that we're alienated or we say you're only, I cannot tell you the number of times people have said, well, why would you do that? You are only A. What do you mean I'm only A? We are all employees of a district that is supposed to be serving our students and families. And with that in mind, it doesn't matter whether I'm a custodian. It doesn't matter whether I am an assistant coach. What matters is my energies need to be very much directed toward working with you to see that our children are protected. And I don't subscribe to the notion that there isn't enough to do things for everybody. I get very offended. I want every single child, irrespective of race, gender, challenge, giftedness, whether they're wealthy or poor, I want every single child to get what they deserve. And so if we work to we together well, and if we show people who don't have kids in schools that we're trying to serve all the schools all the, and all of our children, I think we'll get more out of one another and we'll get more out of the people who probably don't even think about schools. So with that in mind, I'll give my disclaimer that I always give. I speak passionately about what things I believe in, but my speaking passionately does not mean I'm putting you down. It doesn't mean that I would disrespect you or make fun of you. We're all in different places in terms of what we understand about diversity. And so if I say something or do something or look in a way that would make you feel like I'm looking down at you or making fun of you, I want you to call me on it. Because I won't know it unless you tell me. So I'm glad we got a few more people in. What I'd like to do is start with Daryl Wing Sue. For those of you who were here last time in February, he actually is a person that went to my grade school, Abernathy Grade School. And uh, he ended up doing a lot of work, and in fact, has written two books on microaggressions. So with that, what he'll do is he will give us a definition of microaggressions, and he'll, at the end, it's very short take, it's, he, at the end, he'll give us four or five things that we can do to eliminate some of our microaggressions, and in other cases, once they occur, to try to problem solve, to get over it. We can't be stuck in, you hurt my feelings. We can't get stuck there. Every one of us is going to say something at some time or another that we regret. We need to go, oops, then we need to say we're sorry, then we try to enlarge our circle so that we at least know more about other people. The other is people who are not me. So if, if you could give us Dr. Darrell, Sue. Good day, everyone. My name is Daryl Wingsu, and I am a professor of psychology and education at Teachers College, Columbia University. I am also author of Microaggressions in Everyday Life and Microaggressions and Marginality. Today, I would like to share with you some of the harmful impact that microaggressions have on marginalized groups in our society. But what are microaggressions? Well, microaggressions are the everyday slights, indignities, put downs, and insults that people of color, women, LGBT populations, or those who are marginalized experience in their day to day interactions with people. Microaggressions oftentimes appear to be a compliment, but contain a meta communication or a hidden insult to the target groups in which it is delivered. People who engage in microaggressions are ordinary folks who experience themselves as good, moral, decent individuals. Microaggressions occur because they are outside the level of conscious awareness of the perpetrator. In this scene, Michael, an Asian American graduate student, is receiving academic counseling from his sponsor. They have a pleasant conversation at the end of their meeting, the advisor delivers what he believes to be a compliment to Michael by stating, quote, you know you speak excellent English, end quote. Michael is disturbed because it seems to imply that he is not a true American and that he is a perpetual alien in his own country. Microaggressions can also be delivered non-verbally through unconscious behaviors or gestures. In this scene, Jenny has finished a late night at the office and awaits the elevator. As the door opens, she takes one step forward, sees a black male rider, hesitates, and immediately clutches her purse and places her hand over her necklace. 
The hidden communication is that African Americans are prone to crime, will break the law, are up to no good, and will steal. Gender microaggressions occur also frequently to women. In this scene, Laura, a female manager, sits with her male colleagues in a meeting with the president. Note that the men tend to talk to one another, cut her off in mid-sentence, and that the president addresses only the males in the group. When Laura attempts to contribute to the discussion, she is oftentimes ignored. In one case, a male colleague checks his phone rather than listen. What can each and every one of us do to combat microaggressions? We need to realize that microaggressions are unconscious manifestations of a worldview of inclusion, exclusion, superiority, inferiority. Thus, our major task is to make the invisible visible. There are, in essence, five things that we need to do individually. First, learn from constant vigilance of your own biases and fears. Second, experiential reality is important in interacting with people who differ from you in terms of race, culture, ethnicity. Thirdly, don't be defensive. Fourthly, be open to discussing your own attitudes and biases and how they might have hurt others or in some sense revealed bias on your part. Lastly, it is very important to be an ally. Stand personally against all forms of bias and discrimination. I wrote two books, Microaggressions in Everyday Life and Microaggressions and Marginality to help us combat microaggressions at the individual, institutional, and societal level. If we are to become a fair, just, and humane society, I hope each and every one of you will join me in this important journey. Thank you. Okay, with that, if some of you finish your food and would like to move closer, we'd love it if you would, so that we have more of a conversation. Um, we'd love to have you move up. We can have a little more eye contact, and it'll also make it easier for people to hear one another. While they're moving up, the next thing that we will be doing is having each of the panelists introduce themselves, and they'll just kind of tell you a little bit about themselves, and then we'll go back and they will uh, respond to a couple of questions that I have. Thank you very much. So if we could start over on my far right. Uh. Hi, I'm Jody Rutherford. I am a teacher on special assignment with the equity department. This is my second year doing that. And um, I've done other things in the district as well. Um, teacher, instructional coach, literacy TOSA, um, and Prior to that, I was in two other districts. So this is actually my 30th year in education. And I don't feel ready to quit anytime soon. So yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Corrine. <laughs> you also were a person who brought something that she had done in another venue, uh, Courageous Conversations. And one of the reasons that we had a huge team go initially to New Orleans was because this person, shared with another person that it would be a good thing to do. So when you find something good, share it. This has had great impact on Portland Public Schools. Thank you, Caroline. Hello, my name is Paula Dennis, and my calling was the fourth grade. But I've taught high school, I've taught middle school. <laughs> Landed in the fourth grade for about 15 years, um, and now I'm a TOSA. This has been my second year with the equity department here at PPS leading the equity work. <clears throat> I'm John Isaacs, uh, superintendent, or uh, senior policy advisor to the superintendent. And I'm Kim hmm. Nguyen. I've been with the district for the last 26 years. I have uh, held several jobs. I started as a multicultural specialist, and um, every once in a while somebody said, what is that? What's multicultural specialist? So I had a lot of have to respond to, are you an interpreter? No, not quite. What's a multicultural specialist? 
Well, I don't know. At that time, I was trying to figure out what that was. So, <laughs> and then I moved on and uh, did some kind of school counseling at Marshall for three years and then moved on to the Family Support Center. Now I manage interpretation translation for the district and we serve over 100 um, languages and uh, our staff consists of five major language groups, Spanish, Russian, Somali, Vietnamese, Chinese. I'm bilingual in Vietnamese and um, oftentimes people ask if I in interpret for the kids or, or the families, which is very common. I have a lot of stories to tell about my job, which is very challenging. It's gonna be the most challenging job I have had in the district for the last 26 years. Hello, I am Dr. Cori Nandi Sorel Maria Barreras Brown, and um, my inspiration of becoming a teacher was from my first teacher, Mi Abuelo, and I've learned so much from my familia, and I'm very glad to be here, and currently I'm employed with Portland Public Schools as the Interim Program Director for Teen Parent Services. And I'm really pleased that we have these panelists with us. We are missing Kealani and Tamala Newsom. Both, I'm not sure about Tamala, but Kealani went home ill. Nevertheless, last week, or not last week, several weeks ago, each of the panelists presented information about microaggressions to give you a sense of their take on what it meant and how, it, how those kinds of things affected their lives. This week, our focus is on, again, racial micro, microaggressions. And you recall that uh, there are others, and we want to make sure that people understand we're not negating those. That's just the, fa the focus of this particular panel. So what I'd like to do is have them just explore two things, and then we're going to go right to questions. So you'll have an opportunity to um, raise questions of the panelists. I'm sorry that we didn't have as much time last time, but we're going to try to make up for it this time. You'll also be asked after the panelists um, present and you raise your questions, then we will try to have maybe some suggestions for, from you because we don't assume that we're the only ones in the room who know anything about microaggressions. Our focus again though will be on identifying them when they occur, figuring out how do we fix it, and then how do we create an environment within which we lessen the number of microaggressions. And my thesis would be as we get to know the person that we find least des desirable to get to know or furthest away, we will become a very large circle of people who have a lot of ideas. And before we just make a snap judgment or stereotype, we might raise a question rather than automatically assuming if you're standing by the elevator, even though you have a suit on you're probably, and you're African-American male, that you probably are the person who is the custodian or the person who's going to help somebody do something. So um, two things I'd like to pose. The first is um, if each of the panelists would give us one or two strategies that they think would be very helpful in terms of dealing with microaggressions. Because one of the things we know is once something happens, a person makes a mistake or they do something and they didn't do it intentionally. We can either fan the flame. Oh, did you hear what she said? Wasn't that dumb? Can you believe it? And so we start these camps in the district where you forever become known as the person who said X or said Y. Or we can say that was unfortunate, but you know, I know some good things about the person. She did apologize or he did apologize. Let's let go of it and maybe we should go to coffee. Maybe we should talk. I need something in my head that's going to counteract the thing that I think is so horrible that you said or you did. So we can take it in any order you'd like in terms of what do you see are some of the things we can do. And you can be very specific and deal with Portland Public Schools if you choose. Because I think we have a lot to work on in Portland Public Schools. I'm not condemning Portland Public Schools, but what I'm saying is if we put our energy toward fixing that, we will unleash such great positive energy, it'll be unbelievable. Anyone who chooses. When I came to America in 1971 as an exchange student, I thought America was heaven. I didn't know that there were all kinds of issues, social issues, poverty, child abuse, 
racism, gender, you know, of issues. And until I came back in 1975, before the fall of Vietnam, and then I started finding out that there are more to America than what it appears. However, America is a land that provides people with dreams. It provides people with equality. It provides with people with hope that we can all in it, be in it together and fix the social ills to become more equal, to become more fair to every single member of the society. So that was my hope, that when I came back, I know that there were a lot of barriers, but I came back and I faced the challenge. And I consider myself, I consider myself a newcomer to this country, even though I've been here longer than I have lived in Vietnam. And that hope is what is sustainable. That hope is what keeps you going every day without being discouraged, without saying, oh, I don't know, this is so deep, this is so much beyond me. In 2001, I was given the job as a school counselor at Marshall. So this is my story, just one story, and then we can talk more about how we try to patch the, the issues. In, in 2001, I was given a, an emergency license as a school counselor to become a school counselor. And I tried to get out of ESL to, be, uh, to move toward that path. There were three, three other Caucasian counselors. I was introduced to the whole school board as the first ever bilingual bicultural counselor in the district. Betsy Cole, who was the di assistant director for student services, introduced me right here in front of the school board. Kim Nguyen is now the first ever bilingual bicultural counselor in the district. I was given the job, but I was not given the job. I was given a title. I was a showcase for the district. When I came to Marshall, the first thing I was asked by the counselors at that time was, how come she got to be a school counselor? Why was she on a fast track? Why is it that other people pay $60,000 to Lewis and Clark to get that license? And Kim got that <coughs> emergency license. They call me a test case in front of me. They call me that I wasn't fair. They told me I wasn't being fair. And they told me that I was on a fast track right in front of me. I had a little room right across from one of the counselor's room, very tiny, probably designed for an EA or designed for a teacher's assistant. I was put in that little room across the hall from the so-called mainstream counselor. When the intern, one of the interns from Lewis and Clark came to be an intern for one of the counselor, I was asked to move from that room. I was asked to move from that room to be put over where the Xerox machine was in the library. Because the counselor told me that I need to have my intern closer to me. So can, would you mind moving over there? I move over there because I, I have to bite my tongue. I needed to be out of ESL so bad that I would be willing to suffer anything to get out of ESL. The worst has yet to come. The only reason that I got an emergency counseling because I already got an MSW, a Master of Social Work from Portland State in, two, in 1993. TSPC would not have given me an emergency counseling without that, that master's degree. Anyway, when I obtained my, my MSW from Portland State, what I did was I gave up some of the family relationship. My only son was sent to San Jose to live with my sister so that for four years I could finish that degree. So my, my, certif my MSW license does not have a stamp on it. It didn't say that Kim, Kim Nguyen graduated from Portland State with an MSW degree. It didn't stamp on it that I can only work with Vietnamese students. So the counselors at Marshall demanded to have a meeting. Carolyn was, was there. She can tell you the gist of the meeting. The principal had to give in to the council's demands because all of a sudden I was on a fast track and I was placed at Marshall as a school counselor. They demand to see what skills I have. 
they demand to see my official transcript from Portland State. This only happened 12 years ago, in 2001. Kellen was there. I presented my official transcript from Portland State to show what courses I took. Let me tell you, it took me 90 credits to get that Master of Social Work to graduate from Portland State. In the old days, 30 years ago, the counselors only had to take 45 credits to get a master in counseling. 45 credits in, um, as a master in counseling. I still remember that day when Carolyn sat next to me and I presented my official transcripts to these counselors. And I knew deep down my heart that kid that took the room, she was 22 years old, why privilege from Lewis and Clark? She would be getting a counseling job before I get my counseling job from Portland, from Portland Public Schools. The worst has yet to come. After that, I was informed by the HR director that my pay would be cut by $7,000. I was already a multicultural specialist, was already getting a step five in pay. Now, if I decided to stay at Marshall, as a school counselor, my pay would be back down to step two. We appealed that decision. Carolyn was with me all the way. We even went to, I even went to meet with Lorenzo Paul. Lorenzo. Well, Lorenzo Paul, who was a school board <laughs> member at that time, to try to fight that pay. I was told no, because that would open if uh, the director at that time was Steve Goldsmith. He said, if I, decide, if I allow Kim to get that same pay, the step five pay, I would be opening up a floodgate. What floodgate are we talking about now? The floodgate that there will be a dozen other Vietnamese MSWs coming into the system to become school counselors? The irony about it was the floodgate that he was referring to, there was no floodgate. I am still the only bilingual bicultural. MSW in the school district. The floodgate after 12 years did not become a floodgate. What happened for me when the, it's not so much about the pay, the $6,000 pay. At that time, I cried nonstop. It wasn't about the pay. I saw the principal at Marshall after I was told that I was given a $6,000 less in pay. I cried nonstop. And you know why? Because I gave up my relationship with my son to get that decree, the hurt that I gave up four years of my life to get that MSW decree, to give up the relationship with my son, who was only 10 at that time. He went to California to live with my sister in order for me to get a career. And that career meant nothing. That career meant nothing. There was no stamp on my transcript that says I can only work with Vietnamese. Do you know how many times people ask me if I was an interpreter? I work for JDH, and there's hardly any Vietnamese kids in the system. Every time I tell people that I work for JDH, are you an interpreter there? But coming back full circle, two years ago, the principal at Marshall was no longer a principal. He's retired. I, I met him, and I talked to him about my hurt. I said, you could have prevented it from happening. You didn't have to do that. You didn't have to say that the counselors at Marshall has the right to ask me to show my transcripts to them. That very day, it's just like yesterday, I went back to the principal and I said, you could have done it differently and I'm not blaming you. You were trying to get me into the system how long does it take one, for one bilingual bicultural person to get into the system who has earned her dues, who has gone through the loops, loopholes, and then to be told, you're not good enough. Your pay should be reduced to step two because if I allow you to stay at step five, I only ask to stay at the same pay. I would be opening, they would be opening a floodgate. What floodgate are they talking about? We are all here. We could be a gate opener or we could be a gate shut shutter. Which do you choose? 
to be a gate opening, opener or to be a gate shutter. It's all up to us. My experience is real today as if it was 12 years ago. It's real today as if it just happened yesterday. Every single thing I share with you here, it came from my heart. To be sent to a little room next to the copy machine is not, it's no embarrassment. To be told I'm on a fast track is not an embarrassment. The, that what hurts the most is that I gave up my relationship with my son in order to get to a system that doesn't have a heart, doesn't have a heart, doesn't have a soul. Do we choose to work for a system that doesn't have a heart and doesn't have a soul, or do we choose to do it differently? It's up to all of you. We're welcoming um, you. Would you like to just inter we introduced ourselves? And this is the sure, first sure. Uh, Brian Shuley Middle School. Um, I was here like two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. and, uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you for being here. We are actually now addressing um, identifying how we can address microaggressions. So, would someone like to follow Kim? Okay, I have something to say. Thank you, Kim. Oh, yeah. Um, I just want to thank you, Kim. It, um, it puts me in a very emotional space on the compass right now. Um, as a Latina administrator in this district and uh, watching lots of my colleagues and family be treated as if being bilingual and bicultural is a deficit instead of an asset. So I just want to thank you for sharing that and making it known, because it's really important. I think another thing that Kim's um, story reveals is um, how insufficient the word microaggression is, right. because where is that line then where it crosses over into macro and just straight up racism, right? <coughs> so. Um, I know one thing I've <clears throat> been thinking about is, um, is just impact or intent versus impact and that we really need to focus more on the impact than on what I intended. Um, and so I mean that's, that's one strategy for me is, is really being able to look at what's the impact to the other person and especially when I think about um, committing them, yes, I want to, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, horrified or feel like, oh, I can't, you know, can't believe, you know, I just said that. But really, on the other hand, considering um, the milieu of, of uh, the soup of racism that we all grow up in and are all affected by, um, I shouldn't be surprised and you know so I just need to own that you know that that may not have been my intent but that the impact was still felt and so just being able to acknowledge it um, as such um, and then I think the the, the second thing and um, I don't see Rachel out there but we were talking earlier today oh there you are hi you moved up <laughs> Rachel and I were talking today just about um, how part of what makes it hard to own that sometimes is um, my own sense of perfectionism. And when I think about the six conditions of courageous conversations and the sixth condition being examining the presence and role of whiteness, um, to me that's uh, whiteness is equates to that sense of perfectionism and also um, is right in line with, I mean, we talk a lot about racism, but we don't often say the words white supremacy. But I mean, that is what our culture is laden with, you know, and I got all of these messages of white supremacy 
um, growing up and then also that just still are all around me. Um, and so I, for me, that supremacy comes out as this sense of perfectionism, like, you know, I, I can't admit failure. And so um, part of me, for um, part of just decentering whiteness for me is, um, is admitting my imperfection. And um, if any of you have seen Jay Smooth's little talk, 12-minute talk, it's posted at our equity page. Um, that's gone a long way in helping me towards, you know, he calls it the dental hygiene model of viewing racism. Um, and that's, that's really helped me a lot. So I guess what I would say is um, trying to move away from um, perfectionism towards embracing risk and the willingness to make mistakes and to, um, you know, I in the effort to um, get to know people and to, as Carolyn encouraged us to do, and to be willing to um, be willing to make mistakes rather than just to remain silent. Oh, I, I, you know, last time we had this panel meeting, um, I just, my, my mind was all jumbled up because obviously when we talk about microaggression, um, <laughs> like I said, micro, macro, it just kind of throws me off. So it's interesting because as, as I was leaving the meeting last time, I was thinking like if I was talking to my kids about this, my students at school, they would call it racism. So whiteness, it's just, just the fact that Daryl Wings too calls it microaggression. That's, that's whiteness right there. It's, it's so that you can talk about racism in, in this kind of cute way. You know, so it's not threatening to actually deal with the real facts. Just like the Creative Conversations Protocol, another form of whiteness. I mean, you don't need this, like, if you're talking with someone that has, that has consciousness, you don't need the protocol in order to have that conversation. But what you do as a person of color, teacher of color in, in education, that's there to make sure that whoever you're having that conversation with isn't going to escape, right? To hold them, to, hold them accountable to have that conversation. Uh, Microaggression, I just straight call it racism. It's a lot easier. So um, I saw the question earlier, which was uh, one or two strategies for dealing with a microaggression, call it racism. <laughs> or white supremacy, if you feel so. I mean, that's really what you're dealing with. Because, uh, yeah, like Daryl Wing Sue, the way he framed that, I was like, dude, that's all right. That's, that's you're going to have like kind of a semi creative conversation with somebody. I think it was framed that way for me. Um, so people can hear you because sometimes if you call it straight out racism even though that's what it is it shuts people down and what we want is to have that conversation right. it's a difficult one but that's that is our ultimate goal is to have that conversation keep people engaged um, and so sometimes if we need to say it's a white lie instead of it's a lie we don't want to brighten it up with just saying it's white it is a, an aggression, it hurts, it cuts deep, and to say micro minimizes it when it's not minimized at all. When you go home with your stomach hurting and, and really you gotta make some decisions about how am I gonna deal with that one this time? You know, so yeah, it's, I'm, I'm sure that's why in sociology they termed it microaggression so people can hear it. So it's kinda like fishing, you know, that's the bait. And then once you got them in, call racism. <laughs> you know, once the conversation's going. Because uh, actually, if you, and, and we talked about the whole thing about microaggressions, really, like in the long term, that's more detrimental than just straight up racism. So let's just call it something bigger than it is. But once again, you can use the debate, think of it as fishing. <laughs> so I wanted to comment on that, that it, um, the, oh, sorry. Um, so what we do um, when we create this culture of white supremacy and we just sugarcoat it and we have these little mini or microaggressions as we call it, the impact is tremendous and what we're telling our children, what we're telling our children of color is white is better, white is better, you don't fit. So that's what I keep in my heart every moment I interact or engage in a conversation around racism. Because that's right, Brian, it's exactly what it is. It is racism. And what 
what I've learned over time is, is like what Paula said, is that um, sometimes we have to sugarcoat it in order for people to hear us, and in particular order for white people to hear us. So what I've learned is when I hear a microaggression, I usually pause for a moment and take a deep breath because what I really want to do is hurt someone. And in my culture, I say I want to stab someone, but that freaks the hell out of people. You're smiling at me, aren't you? <laughs> Because <laughs> um, I'm not really going to cut someone, right? But it makes me really angry. And so instead of getting angry, I learned from my abuelo to take a deep breath and step into it. Not step back. To take a deep breath and step into it and say, you know, what you said just doesn't sit well with me. And I want, I want to talk a little bit about that. Tell me more about that. What did you mean by it when you said? Because this is what it meant to me. Just, I mean, just looking around the room, I mean, that's a microaggression right there. You know, like, this, this is how much the district cares about this conversation right here. I mean, I know we got a video and all, but I mean, like, you, you look out in the crowd and you go, okay, um, you guys already know. I mean, you guys are here for a reason. Right. You know, where, where are the other folks? Those are the ones we need to reach. You know, I feel like, you know, Oftentimes with the creative conversations, equity in the districts, you're just having the same conversation with, with, with the people that already got it. You know, and anytime right. you know, uh, these creative conversations are supposedly gonna come up, they just get to a certain point, and then you either run out of time, you can't deal with it, uh, it gets called a microaggression, and then just people just move on with it. You know, and then it's like, okay, it's always like a time issue, or you know, uh, more important things we gotta get to, like you know, uh, standardized testing, uh, common core, uh, collaborative planning, um, the bat team, cat team meetings. There's a million different things. You know, I mean, if we, if, and also too, you know, equity being a dis, just a district mandate. So there's a team that meets and they meet and they have these little conversations that stays within there and never, nothing ever gets put into action. So um, I don't speak for Lane Middle School and that's why I left the equity team. You know, I did so much work. I, I was trying to, you know, bring it, obviously put in a certain position to, to bring it and it never got brought. Actually, I'm sorry, I take that back. We did bring it. And then I, I bounced off it because that's all I could do. But, um, I mean, look around. This, is, this, is, this to me is a microaggression. You know, that this is how much that people care in the district about our, our, our students of color, our teachers of color, and the issue of race, equity. You know, I mean, that's district-wide. Thanks, Brian. Awesome. <laughs> So I have, I'm going to give sort of a really prescriptive answer to your question, just thoughts I have. And, and I'm, uh, what I'm about to say is really, for me, I'm going to speak directly to the white people in the room right now. And because microaggressions are, the perpetrators of microaggressions are almost entirely white people. R racial microaggressions. Racial microaggressions, right, right correct. And, um, and by the way, I want to say I really appreciate your point about racism versus microaggression. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and so, you know, to me, they're like to me. If you're a white person here and you want to make a difference, you want to be an ally, as was said in the video. You have to be willing to make a commitment to walking out, not just coming to this and saying, "Hey, I came to this, and that's great, and so I'm educating myself," but actually taking action out of here as an ally. And to me, there's three things. One is you have to be. You got to start with yourself. And uh, you're not perfect, and we're all in a process of working on this, um, increasing our consciousness. And you're gonna, you're, you know, everyone in here is gonna commit a microaggression, is going to say something that's got bias or racism. And when you get called on it, you have to be, you have to be willing to listen, hear it, and then work on improving yourself. Um, so to me, it's like start with yourself. Um, the second thing is, you have to be willing to call people on it. I mean. The, the reality is, I, in my experience, white people are more uh, sort of willing to commit microaggressions or, or take actions or say things that are racist or discriminatory when there's a, another white person there because somehow it makes them feel a little safer to do it. And you have to be willing to call people on it when it happens. And um, if you're not willing to do that, if you're not willing to have the courage to do that, then you're not you're not participating in solving the problem. You're allowing the problem to just perpetuate itself. Again, what's the point of being here and of being aware of it if you're not willing to speak up and be an ally and call uh, other white people on it? And then the third thing is, 
to, um, you know, I have found myself since I've been here adopting some preventative uh, educational strategies. Um, I really am so glad in the video that he brought up the example of the meeting dynamic where all the white guys are having a meeting as if the woman is not there. And the reason I'm glad is if I, if I could pick out one my, quote unquote microaggression that I have observed repeatedly since I've come to work here two months ago, that is it. Like I have, I've watched that. And it's something that I am personally um, just happen to be highly aware of because um, of the processes I'd gone through in my own life when I worked in a workplace where I was one of only two white people and it was mostly people of color where I was engaging in that behavior, but it was an environment where I got called on it repeatedly, right? And so, um, you know, you, as, you, as your consciousness raises and you improve your own behavior, you become aware of things. And so I'm actually personally not able to participate very effectively in a meeting where it's run where people can just talk, where it's like you interrupt that person to have your say and you interrupt your person to have that say and there's no facilitation, which that's a, just, it's a very white male, way of meetings happening. You know, you get to just sort of decide when you're going to speak because you're smart and you know more than everybody else. It's a very, you know, that used to be me, <laughs> but I have, it is one behavior I, I can tell you very confidently. I have cleansed from my system to the point where I, I actually can't participate in those meetings. I get very uncomfortable. So I have now started in meetings to say, hey, you know what would be really great in this meeting if we could have a, a someone facilitate it and keep a speakers list. And if I want to speak, um, uh, you know, just get on the list so that everyone has a chance because the way we've done our meetings is really a very white way of doing it. And I just put it out there in a couple of meetings. You know, white people are very comfortable just talking over other people. Um, to me, that, I, to me, that's a preventative strategy. It's a way to make a meeting more inclusive so that it works for everyone there. Um, so anyway, like I said, very prescriptive. Those are three strategies I've adopted in my own. Thank you. I think, and I think what you just said is really quite helpful when we speak to what can we do in Portland Public Schools to make changes? And I have a couple of suggestions, and you might think of one or two, and then we're going to give you a chance to do questions. One of the difficulties I had in my 44-year career with Portland Public Schools is that the district will take on topics and have nobody who has knowledge of the topics involved in the decision making. I had a granddaughter who, because she looked like she was white, I really wanted her to go to a school where she would be around people of color. And so when they had the Japanese magnet program that's now, it's at Richmond, that whole program was planned without any Japanese people. And the teachers who taught it were white. And she came home telling me she was white and there were a few people that had different eyes and dark hair. And I said, you're not white and that school's not white. And when uh, several of us, I had one friend, she put her daughter in too. We said, well, we're going to integrate that school. So we got some black kids to go there. But it was, a, it was a, a white Japanese program. It was so far off in gender that the Japanese people who had boys said, we can't keep them here. They're going to be talking like girls. We fought to get a Japanese teacher. We fought, and they said, there's no Japanese curriculum. I said, hmm, I think somewhere in the world there are Japanese people, you know. <laughs> you know and we have Japanese organizations here. Yes. But the audacity and the people who put their kids in that school were primarily white people who were very well educated, and they knew they were getting a $10,000 education uh, by putting them in a school where they learn a second language. They didn't have to send them to private school. But it was a huge fight. But the audacity to think that you could plan the whole thing without any of the people. It was very difficult for me to hold my tongue when I used to go to leadership and they go, black and brown boys, we want our black and brown boys to achieve. It was all white, it was mm. primarily women, one or two men. And I said, we have black principals here, hello. <laughs> they were born black, they grew up black, but they never asked them anything. I said, have you ever read Kanjufu? Have you ever read Nichols? No. And then they said, well, we have schools where black and brown boys are doing well. And I said, I bet you do. And I bet you those are biracial children or they're children that don't know they're black. For instance, in Irvington, when my children were young, we had a bimodal distribution for these black boys. And they said, well, we have these black boys who are doing well. I said, of course. Their mothers are white. And they don't see them as black. So one thing I would say is the authenticity. If you're talking about a group, engage some people of the group in the discussion. Another thing that makes me very sad is how we interview for key positions, and it never occurs to us that we might have a person of color or a person who's different. They're not high enough in the organization. 
and I'm sorry, but people who know very little about how to make the change sit and make a decision, and then they bring a, a coach or somebody to help them learn the job. That doesn't work for me. If we're serious about changing our district, we want people who are different, who have the skills, irrespective of their title, to sit down and lay it out. If we're trying to diversify, we need people who understand diversity. And I'm glad you, as a white person, are getting some of the things that we need. But how do you have an interview and only have one person to interview and they get the job? How? Are you committed to diversity? So what I'm saying is we have to open up our eyes and recognize you can't make it in this district anymore. Now Latinos are a larger population than blacks. So you've got blacks, Latinos, Native Americans, and Asians. And they're not just a little tiny drop in the bucket anymore. The population of white children is less now, proportionately. You need people of color. And get rid of the code words, well, they have all the qualifications, but they won't fit. They won't fit means white people will have to share the power and listen to other people's ideas. We need all kinds of ideas in order to serve our children. And I mean all the children. I will fight as hard for our wealthy white children who are highly gifted who get screwed too because they don't have what they need. Every single child needs what they need. So I, as a facilitator, offer one thing. It's not my role to do it. But open up your eyes and ask the question. Who's on the panel? Who's involved on the team? What do they bring to the table? And make space for them to speak. So um, I want to know if any of the other panelists want to give us one or two things, and then we'll take your questions. I kind of wanted to piggyback on what you said. Um, sometimes we're in meetings, and people say, research says. <laughs> ask, <laughs> follow up. Who's research? By who? White folks about little black boys? That don't always fly. And sometimes what we see in the classroom, if our only interactions are with the little black boys, you don't know what their parents stand for. I can tell you my daughters acted differently at school than they did at home with me. So if that is your only inclination of what little black boys and black girls, brown boys and girls are bringing to the table, need to do some thinking and processing and, and get out there and meet some people and get a, a more realistic viewpoint of what blackness is, what brownness is. Um, it's, it's interesting that you, you mentioned the, the, the immersion program. My daughter goes to the immersion program. And just being around the immersion program, um, once again, I mean, that's a perfect example of white supremacy within the district. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the immersion, the, you know, I mean, not, not trying to diss the school, but once again, I'm looking through a critical eye of what I've seen in the district, being a teacher and a parent in the district. And the immersion programs, they, they basically serve non-native speakers of that language who happen to be white. Mm -hmm. You know, my daughter uh, grew up speaking both Japanese and English perfect. You know, I mean, her, her Japanese is, she's probably the top in her class. And that school's not helping her with her, Jap with her Japanese. I mean, she can maintain it somewhat, but she's, it's not, it's not helping her. You know, so so the the place that they're going to is to the, that the you know non non Japanese non native speaker white students in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know, and that's that's the target, not my daughter to like raise her up. You know, she's actually maybe she should be, be put on the payroll because I'm not sure if she helps the class, but she's her Japanese isn't getting better because of that school, and um, you know also the cultural benefits as well. Now, if you if you think about it, there's on on a Saturday there's this Japanese school. They meet once a week, and they are actually teaching at, I guess, the, st the same standards as they do in Japanese grade level. So the kids that go to that school, in addition to going to a school like Richmond, have to go there to get all the other stuff to bring them up to that level. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if Richmond Elementary was functioning the way it should be, they, the, the kids wouldn't be going to Saturday school. That's the way that school should be operating for all kids. So I'm not sure if that makes it any clearer about, about, about maybe that equity question. Like, if it's good for these kids, it's good for everybody. Mm -hmm. I want to see every single kid coming out of that school completely bilingual, completely fluent. Not because, oh, wait, it's pretty good for Portland, Oregon. No, but, but like this, they could go to Japan and sit in Japanese class at the same grade level and achieve. So once again, our immersion program. In Lane Middle School, we have, we have a Russian immersion coming to our school, which I think totals out to about 19 students. We have a Spanish class, you know, I mean, we have a lot of Spanish speakers in the class, or I'm sorry, at our school. 
And the Spanish class is taught by a white woman. Nothing against her, but what message does that give our, our Latino boys? That we can bring an immersion program to our school, but we can't get a native speaker of Spanish to teach a Spanish class so you can get a high school credit? That's ill, logic. Right. So I wanted to comment on what you just said because I was in a meeting um, the other day um, with PEG and it was Spell, Special Ed, and um, ELL looking at our data here in Portland Public Schools. And I specifically said what you said. And I had a white man in the room who um, is a leader in some of the programs, an administrator, call me a liar, basically call me out in front of everybody, said that's just not true. And I said, well, that's my truth. This is, and this is what the data is supporting, is that our, bi our language immersion programs are really set up for white folks. Mm -hmm. And that how do we address that if we don't even believe it exists for the, the white folks that are in charge, right? So I guess really to interrupt the system is to one, believe the stories that you're hearing because they're multiple perspectives, they're truths. And to not always go to, well, that just can't be true. That, that, can't, that can't be real. Because we, we take care of all kids in Portland Public Schools. You know, and our data doesn't say that, right? I think the saddest part for me when I enter the school system in 1987, this is the year that I started with Portland Public Schools, was to see that our kids had no role models, strong role models, the people in positions of decision-making abilities. We have a system where 100% of the kids are minority kids coming from all over the world. But we have mainly 90% of the teachers are monolingual white and 90% of the people who at the lowest totem pole are bilingual paraprofessionals. And you know what that means to be a paraprofessional in this system. Low pay, debt and positions, no prospect of going anywhere. Basically, the last 30 some years, we have bilingual paraprofessionals in the system who are ready to retire. And their pay is still less than a school secretary. What do they do? They are in the classroom to, to translate or to Xerox for teachers to be a subservient for the teachers. What the, what the students see is very, very, very dismal. Why do I want my children to become, a, to become like them? No, I don't want the kids to, be, to have role models which tell them that you are a second class citizen in the, in the system. Now that I work with these same people who are interpreters, oftentimes if they don't like an interpreter, they told me, get rid of that person. How can you, as a white monolingual person, decide whether the interpreter is good enough for you? I have it. It happened to us very, very often. We don't like so-and-so. Please don't send that person. So I challenge the system. How do you know that this interpreter is not doing the right job? What language do you speak? Do you speak Cantonese? Do you speak Mandarin? How do you measure their effectiveness? Or just because you don't like the way they interpret it for you? Maybe they don't act subservient enough for you. Maybe they came in with an attitude, and their attitude is that I am just as first class citizen like you. And that's what I train the people I work with. You come in, you act like first class citizen. Do they like you? If they don't like you, tough. You are here to stay. You are 32 years in the system. Nobody's gonna get rid of you. How can you treat people who convey important messages to the parents, to the families, and treat them like a second class citizen? How can you have the authority to fire someone? You didn't hire that person. You have no authority to fire that person. It's only common sense. Our kids know that. Our kids know that even though they don't speak a single word of English, they know when they get treated as a second class citizen. When I first came to the system, some of them were in the locker's room. Some of them were up on stage. 
What's wrong? We were the last one to be planned for in that any school. Any school you walk into, ESL will always be the last kids to be planned for. It's been 26 years. What have we done? We damage kids. We damage adults. We damage a whole generation. We have a saying, if a doctor makes a mistake, he only kills one patient. If a teacher makes a mistake, he or she kills the whole generation of kids. Why is it so pervasive? Why? I keep asking me, and myself, sometimes I go to sleep, I ask myself, why is it that we are treated that way? The only hope I have is that in America, in Vietnam, it's like we accept our fate. If we were born poor, we will be poor all our lives. We will have no upward mobility. So we accept it. But the reason we came here, some of our parents came here, is because we have upward mobility. We have freedom. We can be who you are, the best you can be. Look at the ESL program. It's still the same, very similar to what has happened 26 years ago. Don't tell me that it has changed. Do you know how much a teacher makes compared to a paraprofessional? She or he makes three and a half times more in an organization where a person speaks that valuable language is making a third compared to somebody who doesn't speak that language, something is wrong with equity. Carolyn, I, I apologize. I have to leave. I have a meeting. I have to run in 10 minutes. Um, I meant to say that at the beginning. I apologize to everyone. So, it, um, But I just want to say, I just want to say that um, I think the point about this actually being a macro problem, we're talking about microaggressions and the comments I made earlier about, uh, you know, we're very prescriptive to like those things that happen around in a workplace. But I think what I'm hearing and what I hope we're all hearing is that there's a macro problem and we're all part of work here to t get to the macro solutions. Um, and speaking now, you know, as a, a white person on this panel, to me, for the white people who work here, we're either in two spots in my mind. We're either helping accelerate the solution or we're, we're standing in the way of it. And um, you know, every, we all have to ask ourselves, which, which are we? Are we gonna help advance this work or are we going to be a hindrance to it? Um, and you know, again, keeping it personal and local, you know, I'm thrilled to be able to help accelerate this work. We have a school district that's right now 45% students of color, very, very soon it's going to be over half of our students are students of color. Um, it's the only way we're going to be successful in educating the next generation of kids. There is no, no other way. And it's going to involve taking on all the problems and all of the, the that we're hearing about here. We have, to, we have to take all of these things on and, and solve them. Um, so anyway, I'm going to leave with that. And I apologize that I'm leaving early. So thank, thank you. you very much. Okay. Um, now we are going to move to questions, but I'm hoping that you're understanding that even though we present things as being dismal, that we believe, and I believe more than anything, we have the capacity to move toward an organization that can own its stuff and can value, truly value diversity and recognize that we are so much stronger if we learn about one another and join hands to do it. It's not a, oh, it's so bad we have to give up. It's more like, we need to raise our level of consciousness, be open, be willing to hear what people have to say and withhold judgment until we process it, and then be willing to move beyond our mistakes to joining hands and getting the work done. Truly implementing what we call the equity policy that we have, calling it out when we don't have a diverse group of people in the room, even beyond you know, it's gender, it's race, there are many other ways that we are diverse. It's language. We need to make sure that we're inclusive. So with that, we're going to open it to questions and we'll stop just a little short of the time that we're to get out of here because we are going to ask that people reflect on and think what can each of us do individually to walk out of this room with something that we can do that can erode this thing we're trying to get rid of.
Well, I'm just wondering if any of you have, can give any concrete examples, any experiences that you've had where you have interrupted a microaggression or a macroaggression or outright racism um, successfully. How do you define success? <laughs> like a paradigm shift? Mm. <laughs> In, yeah. I, yeah, I guess, I guess with, with the person being willing to come back and talk to you again, maybe. Or open their mouth again. Oh, well, they have no choice with the protocol. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, yeah. So uh, I, had a, I had a talk with uh, with uh, with a white colleague that um, basically, like, you know, I, I was saying, like, you know, look, as a white educator, when you're speaking to students of color, they don't respond to you. And at that time, what was said to me was, well, um, maybe you should find a principal of color to work for. And I just, I just stood back for a second and just went, hmm, that's interesting. And, um, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, it was a big conversation that was happening. You know, so I kind of just put that to the side, and I guess the parking lot, as teachers call it. And I was like, I'm gonna come back to that. So I did approach the person later on. And I said, this is what you said, yes? And the person said yes. And I just let him know, at some point in time, we're gonna, I want you to think about what was said about that. And, and, and at some point in time, we're gonna have that conversation. In a couple weeks, Maybe in a couple weeks I'll approach that person and, ha and have a conversation with them. But the interesting thing about it is that if I do go fire, if, say, if I, say if I leave the school that I'm at right now and I go to a different school to work, that still doesn't solve the problem about right. that interaction. <laughs> and uh, that person hopefully is thinking about it, you know, but I came at it not from this place of like, you know, I'm coming from the emotional quadrant and I'm ready to throw a punch you or with a stab you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, know, you I, but I, was like, I was like, look, this is what you said, yes, yes, okay. We're gonna have this conversation right here. Not, not, right, not right away, but think about that, what, you, what was said. So it's on the table, right? And this is not coming from a place of like, I don't, I don't wanna destroy your character here, but if we are to work together, then we need to walk, work through this little thing right here. And I'm glad you said it too, actually. Thank you for the micro, I mean, sorry for the racism. Thank you, appreciate that, because once again, if people understand, this is a person coming say, saying that uh, they understand white privilege and, and this is what was said. So, once again, I guess it's not so much like interrupting it. I mean, it was already said, so I didn't really interrupt it. I mean, if I was gonna interrupt it, it'd be like, oh, don't, don't say that, you know. Um, and I think it will be successful. You know, I think that person's probably thinking about it. I've definitely thought about it my whole life. Um, so, yeah, at that point when we have that conversation, I think it'll be productive. For me, I don't think I have a goal of um, doing the paradigm shift because I think it's a process. You didn't learn how to be racist in one day. Um, so I do like to plant a seed and I like to be thoughtful and I do use the protocol and, and um, also I use a lens that, uh, of Christianity and I just have a belief that um, the non-closure piece that the Lord will provide an opportunity for me to come and engage with that person again in some kind of way. But when something is said that, it, it, that feels wrong um, sometimes I make light of it. Oh, that punch! That that punch hurt pretty good there. Or I might say, "How do, how did you want that to land with me?" Mm -hmm. And I let them think about it and marinate. And sometimes they'll come back, and then we'll provide that will provide. Carolyn was talking about coffee, but it provides that opportunity where you sit down and have a conversation um, and tell them uh, your point of view and how that landed with you. So it might not be the huge paradigm shift, but as long as they're at home thinking about it and wrestling about it, and if they avoid me every time they see me, after a while, after a while they're gonna run into me, so, you know. I was gonna ask about um, dealing with microaggressions amongst students if people have thoughts on ways to deal with that. Mm -hmm. uh, microaggressions, macro. Yeah, that's a good question. <coughs> uh, you know, just, just, just yesterday, you know, uh, I was sitting there, uh, my student teacher taking over my class, I had to be out of the class, otherwise I'd start teaching. So I, I was out of the class, and um, I was sitting there, was getting some stuff done, and one of our students came over and was just completely upset. And she said, I needed to leave that class because if I didn't, I was gonna slap that teacher in the face. And I'm like, oh, 
hey, okay, what's what's going on? Break it down, you know. And, and she went through the whole story, and it, the, the whole, I mean, it was basically a story of microaggression. Like they had a small group, they were getting some work done. She was trying to read. Two people pulled her off task. Teacher looked over. You know, she happens to be black, and all of a sudden, hey, uh, what is it that you're doing? Why are you why are you guys not on task? Focusing on her. You're a leader placing that responsibility on her, not the other two that were off task and she was trying to get back on task. You're a leader. And she's like, no, I wasn't, not, uh, you, you're not doing the work. You know, and she's like, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna leave now. If you leave the room, I'm gonna give you a referral. I'm gonna leave. And um, I just went, I just looked at her, I go, well, you know what? That is a microaggression. And she just went, yeah, that's racist. That's racist. <laughs> and I was like, all right, all right, chill. Take it easy. Get a piece of paper, write down exactly what happened. From, from the very beginning, because it was like five or six different issues that kind of sprung out with one little interaction. So she's like, okay. And she went down and wrote, wrote, started writing, writing stuff down. And at the same time, one of, our other uh, one of my other colleagues was there too, and he was like, oh, thank you so much for that. I was like, that's, because he, he, he gets it too. But you know, just to put it down on paper, and you just gotta take a step back, just hang out for a second. You know, but um, I think that the kids, the kids, I mean, if you wanna know about equity, you wanna know about microaggressions, racism, whatever, talk to the kids. I mean, I'm surprised there's not a kid panel yeah, here. See it, right? Yeah, I mean, you have a kid panel here from our school. Like, you're gonna hear all kinds of crazy stuff. You think I'm tame? Um, <laughs> you know, they're they're gonna tell you exactly how it is and who it is. You know, they they got the school dialed. They know it perfectly. So she so anyway, she wrote that down, and I'm not sure what happened. I was on a field trip today, which is why I was late. But um, but she knew that. Okay, that was acknowledged. Mr. Chu gets it. Mr. Hall gets it. I think things gonna be okay. They got my back. And she went back to class or whatever, and I think everything was cool. So, well, I, I'm gonna chime in here because I'm glad that you brought that up because um, as a teacher, I know that I would deal with students and their microaggressions towards me. Um, and I think a lot of times we miss that piece. And I know being an African American woman and a teacher and teaching white students and them feeling like they've never had a black teacher before mm -hmm. you possibly you can't, teach, can't me. teach me anything mm -hmm. or why are you te teaching about black history you're racist you're this I think it's the same thing you have to begin to address them and right now I'm going through a microaggression <laughs> with um, a student who um, is, is, is a white girl and feels that she has the power to email me and say to me, you and I need to meet so we can talk about your role as a super SAC liaison person, mm -hmm. right? Well, liaison uh -huh. is a person. So in that, it's like, okay, I don't respond because I don't owe you that, right? So no response is a response. And so later she feels in front of not, not only me, but at a meeting she feels <coughs> that um, in front of my supervisor and in front of my supervisor's um, supervisor that I'm going to tell you what your role is. And your role is to come to these meetings and set off to the side and don't say anything. And if we have questions, we'll ask you. And she felt very comfortable saying that. Mm -hmm. So to me it was enough is enough. And I got up, I explained what my role was, and I told her directly in front of everyone else that I found her behavior to be disrespectful, mm -hmm. right? So I think you have to... Call it out. Call yeah, it out. call it out, and you have to address it with students. And it's interesting because she doesn't understand that she comes from a really white, privileged attitude. And the fact that she feels like, as a 17-year-old child, you can come to an adult and say, one, she stated to all the way up to our superintendent, she needs to be fired. Um, we need to have a, you and I need to have a meeting and talk about what your role is, your position is. Um, no, let me tell you what your role is. So you see that, and to me it was, I've never experienced it on that level with kids. I've had kids upset with me, you're unfair, you're racist, because all you want to teach is black history, or I've had parents come in the room and say, you know, come to school and say, well, I want to talk to my child's teacher. And I'm saying, okay, well, let's sit down and talk. No, no, I want to talk to my child's, you know, teacher. And it's like, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the teacher. And they have this look like, no, you can't possibly be my child. So, but it was just interesting. So I think, once again, I would say, you just have to address it. You have to address it. 
no matter whether, whether it's a white teacher experiencing microaggressions from, you know, um, a kid of color or the other way around, or from boys, it, it's just something that has to be addressed. Because as you see, with me letting it go on and just saying, I'm, okay, I'm not gonna, I don't have time to respond to this. It just got worse and worse and worse. Now, whether she gets it, which she probably doesn't get it, but at the same time, there's a boundary that's been set that, and it's a line that she can't cross with me. As a teacher, you have the capacity, though, to set up your room and away from the very beginning right. that you create that space for all kids. Right. And you don't allow kids to be isolated. And you don't allow kids. In other words, you set it up there. I have arms where, that are wide enough to embrace you all. Right. And mm -hmm. I'm going to do what's good, what I perceive to be good for you. And I may do something different for another student. So it has everything to do in a classroom with living it out and owning your stuff. Right. Encouraging your, your kids exactly. to call you on it. If they see you doing something that they perceive as being unfair, mm -hmm. then they right. call you on it. And when you set up that kind of thing, you'll find the kids will call you and they'll call right. other people in the room. You create a norm right. where this is not tolerated. No. We are who we are. We have the abilities we have. If you step over the line, it doesn't matter what color you are. We're going to try to, everybody suffers when one of you misbehaves or does something. So I think. We have more room as teachers to create that space mm -hmm. for everyone and be a part of that circle so that they can call us. Because we have blind spots, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out because I would also tell at the beginning of um, each um, class, at the, at the very beginning, I would always tell them, you know, I have two rules and one was about respect, but I would always say that if you feel like I've done something or I'm doing something that offends you or that has hurt, hurt your feelings or you feel is not fair, know that you can set up a mediation with me, your parent, you can talk, it's an open door with the principal or the counselor. And by, like you said, by saying that, it sets the tone and kids felt comfortable enough to express if I did something or someone else did something in the room, how that made them feel and they knew they had that platform and we could talk about it and talk about it in a safe environment. And so not to mention, I'm, I'm glad you brought right. that up. And also in, the, in the, the PPS handbook for students' rights and responsibilities, it's, it's their right. Right. You know, so. Right. Um, I was gonna make one comment to all of that about creating the safe space. I just remember when I was working down in North Carolina and um, my students, we created spaces for if anybody was talking, because sometimes there's like, we're taught in teacher education programs that everything has to be linear, linear and you have to have a schedule and you have to follow times and you gotta cover this much curriculum and this deep, you know, across the whole entire freaking year. And so um, I think that what was um, powerful when I first started teaching was really creating that space when there was um, a hot mess to step into, you You stepped into the hot mess with your students. So like we always said, we would pause and we would say, oh no, here we go. And it would be like, let's talk about this. No, we're not moving on. We gotta talk about this stuff. What I heard you say. And kids were given, empowered to be able to do that to each other. You know, and it, and, and it really wasn't a hot mess because what happened was what appeared to be a hot mess really ended up being something pretty delightful. That we got to have those courageous conversations and be able to dialogue with one another and the kids are the ones that really bring the powerful message to us. And then secondly is I feel like sometimes what happens in our classrooms is that we don't create the opportunity for student voice. And I feel like in the beginning, if you allow that opportunity for kids to really establish a space for their voices and multiple, pers multiple perspectives at the table, that they're more likely to step into that hot mess. Um, I wanted to kind of address what you were saying too. I actually, I'm working in a, a day treatment program with Portland Public Schools contracts with those staff are not part of Portland, Portland Public Schools. And I'm working with three young white women who um, Okay, I'm gonna say they don't know how to deal with me. Um, they don't know how to address me in a respectful way. They don't know how to um, hear what I have to say without me being a threat to them somehow. Mm -hmm. 
everything I say, especially if I disagree with them, is intimidating. Um, I feel like I am in a, it's beyond microaggressions. It's just beyond microaggressions. And I feel like I, I basically have been backed into a corner. I can't say anything because, you know, I'm the problem. But if I don't say anything, I'm not doing my job. So I, you know, and I have been self-reflecting up the wazoo. <laughs> and just like, okay, what am I doing? What can I do? What did I do? You know, what will I do the next time? All of that. And it's just me. And then that agency and then that supervisor who is an older white man who also doesn't know how to deal with me uh, in a respectful way. He's very condescending in his speech to me. And I've gotten to a point where I'm actually, and I hate to acknowledge this, but I am actually returning that condescension to him. And I don't like that. I don't like that about that I have come to that place. Okay. But um, it's every day and it's ongoing and, and you know, I have some support with my supervisor, but he's not there every day, you know, like they are. <laughs> and I just, I, I guess, what would you do? Anybody, what would you do? That one is a very hard one to deal with, and over my career, I've dealt with it a lot. I wasn't always this hard, but I was. It was like the big black woman made the white lady cry, and so, so fine. No, seriously. One time we were just doing a book, and the kerning of the type was such that every time you did of and the, uh, it looked like of the. And I said the children that I know that are not literate, even though this is a third grade book, will think it's of the. You know, they will not read those as discrete words. Well, the lady who presented the book, now this is about the tithe. She throws up her hands and she runs out of the room and she's out in the bathroom for like a half hour. Then another lady goes to get her and she comes back in and she's purple. And I said, look, I'm not going to be the big black gorilla that makes the white lady cry. And I just let it sit there until they got a grip on it. But there is a dynamic that people have to deal with. Blackness is often considered to be big. Somebody told me a big black man came to see, no, they didn't say black. A man came to see him. I said, well, who? I didn't have any appointments. Who would it be? Who could it be? And I'm guessing, well, he was really big. And I thought, hmm, big, probably black. I said, was he black? Yeah. And then I finally guessed. This man weighs 142 pounds. He's like 5'6". Blackness has a way of taking over the room, and it has nothing to do with the, the person who's black. It has to do with the perception of white people about the blackness. And I had an instance where I had to take on one of the, the higher ups who happened to be black because it was a counselor, and she was, she's large, she's very dark, but she has a very me, 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 me voice, so you couldn't pop. She's like Minnie Mouse. And the white psychologist said, Every time you come in the room, I feel threatened. The black administrator said to the black lady, well, you need to go and learn how to be, next, how to be less threatening. I said, uh-uh, 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 wrong. You need to say to the white woman, this woman, has she ever said anything to you? Has she ever hollered at you? Has she ever done anything? You need to go see your shrink and figure out <laughs> why just the very act of her being black would make you upset. And I'm not minimizing how people get those things. If you read the book, uh, Learning to be White, and some of the other kinds of things, you learn how to respond to people by little things that happen to you when you're under five years old. Mm -hmm. right. Like you might be afraid of black men, and it might have been your mother every time she saw a black man grabbed your hand really tight. That's something that's in your psyche. So I'm not angry for people being that way, but what I'm going to do is say, don't ask me to get help when it's you. Or they'll say, you're angry. I said, have I ever cursed at you? Have I ever done any of these? No. I said, I'm passionate when I speak. But I appear to be, because I'm not afraid to take chances, but I'm a rule follower. And that's what I had to tell them. I said, you'll never find me going above my boss. You'll never find that I say anything about my boss that I haven't said directly to their face. I said, you perceive because I'm a risk taker that I'm a renegade. I am not a renegade. Hmm. So I think we have to help our system recognize what is it 
What about my behavior? And that's how I respond to people. What was it about my behavior that led you to believe that I'm angry? What could I have done differently because you have taken this one little thing that I said about a book and turned it into a big thing between you and me? But this has to be addressed. Uh, there were a couple of people that attended the session last time who said, every time I, a person of color, every time I do anything, I'm over scrutinized. And people talk as if somehow I, I, I don't have the same degrees as everybody else. We have to call it out when we see it. And we have to enfranchise all people in the district. They have the skill, whether they're black or white or native or whatever. Don't talk down about them because they aren't exactly like you. If they have the skills and they come at it with a different direction, welcome it. We can all grow. But I know what you're saying, and it's pretty hard because other people don't, they don't understand it. You know, well, you got a chip on your shoulder, or you don't participate. I, I can't make you feel comfortable. I've had to say I was born black, and I will be black for all of my life. Now, if you can tell me something that I can do to help you, I'll be happy, but I cannot be not black. <laughs> I've tried. <laughs> I, I wanted to speak about, uh, you, you mentioned like, the condescension that was returning back to these folks, right? And uh, I just, right, and I just wanted to acknowledge that. I mean, that, that is a response to oppression. And that is one way, because like, the thing is, if you, if you don't, what, what it does, it just, it just will eat you from the inside out, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, I, I mean, same thing, you know, at, at Lane Middle School, I'm intimidating, you're using a male privilege to, like, bully people into equity, whatever it is, you know? And I'm like, well, look, that's, that's on you, you know? This is who I am, you know? And they're saying, like, you know, you're, you're angry. And um, I tried to let them know, like, if, like, you know, we had this little circle thing, little circle time with the staff. And uh, during that time, I, m I just said, you know, if you really knew who I was, because they, you know, they have the little st sentence starters, right, and you kind of speak about something. And I said, if you really knew who I was, you'd know that it's not anger. It's a response to oppression or white supremacy. You know, this is after we did this, this equity PD. And people came to me, and like, you came off really angry. <laughs> like, why are you not angry? You know, I mean, imagine if it was your child that was in this school, and this is what we are dealing with, you know? So once again, I just want to acknowledge that condescension. It's not, you should feel, you should, I mean, I understand why you feel bad about it. That's a response to oppression. I think, I think it's interesting because as a person of color, you're used to getting labeled as angry, aggressive, instead of it l being looked at as, wow, sort of passionate. Or love. Right, or assertive. For the children. Um, so I just think that's interesting. But um, were you here last week? Was it last week? No, two weeks ago for the it was cracking week, the code. Oh, no, that was just last week. It was the fifth. Yeah. Were you the oh. Code? Oh. Yeah. So if if you have time, I would suggest you watch that film because it talks about. Uh, um, I don't know. Is it on YouTube? It's, um, there may be parts. Let me. I'll get your email afterwards, okay. and we and I'll, I can okay. get it to you. And I'm gonna throw out there. I see Sid got his hand up. It's okay to be angry. I'm pissed off about some of the stuff I see and hear. And as Carolyn was saying, a 150-pound black man, but they're attacking little boys in first grade. Right. Yeah. Kindergarten, Kindergarten, first grade. So we need to start speaking up and speaking out. I was pretty excited to hear we were going to have a follow-up of last week because I had to leave about 20 minutes before it was over. You missed the good stuff. I'm hearing things, and I hear it so often. People talk about racism, and I'm not hearing people talk about prejudice. And prejudice. And what I'm interested in is, does anybody on the panel see a distinction in those, and if they would explain that? Um, uh, well, I think you're asking about the distinction between prejudice and racism. Right. So racism always has a power base. Mm -hmm. um, so therefore, um, because white is the dominant and is the power base, um, only white people can be racist, but anybody can be prejudiced. So we all grow up with our various prejudices. And, and referring back to cracking the code, 
Um, there was a black woman in the film who shared about um, going into a Chinese restaurant and being refused service. So there was a case of um, another person of color actually, um, you know, discriminating against that person. Um, but technically, you would say that's not racism because neither of them were in the power base. It all serves to um, support white supremacy when people of color are discriminating or exhibiting prejudice towards one another. Did, does that help, Sid? I know you're kind of an expert on this, so how'd I do? <laughs> Don't call me an expert. Uh, no, I, your description of racism is great, as far as I'm concerned. It's the power piece. The thing that I think happens so often is we confuse those two things. And when we try to deal with racism, mm -hmm. we have to deal with the structures, we have to deal with the power, we Sorry. have to deal with the policies. When we deal with prejudice, we're dealing with emotions and feelings that we have, mm -hmm. and we can deal with those in other ways. Mm -hmm. And yeah. in terms of the microaggressions, I think what I'm hearing is we deal with that either by being hurt when they do those little silly, I shouldn't say little silly, those slights that we hear people use, we can go away and, and feel real bad, or we can see where they are coming from. And we can either call them on it, or we can go about our business and continue to be who we are. That's just my thought. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sid. I, I find it interesting that, I mean, you know, we talk about like systemic racism, I mean, or you know, let's talk about the school systems, you know, the, race, the, the white supremacy that exists with the PPS. We, we are a part of the system, you know, and, and that transcends race, gen that's like, like uh, systemic racism is colorblind. You know, like you can have a person of color working in a school, be just as white, it would be a white supremacist, you know? So uh, prejudice, mm -hmm. prejudice with power run through a system, that's racism. Prejudice, I mean like, you know, if you don't have, a, if you don't have any power, it's like, hey, all right, cool. You know, uh, it's the systemic. So once again, prejudice plus power systemically run through the systems or the institutions. Um, I don't know. Interesting. You I like question. that because there is internal racism that right. you know folks have amongst each other. You have a question back there, or a comment? I'm, I'm, I'm so really concerned about. I, I don't know your name, but your situation. I just wonder. Um, yeah, and, and you said that you had a supervisor who was supportive but isn't there. And, and so if there's a person uh, in a supervisory position, it seems to me that if there's, you know, they need to deal with these people who are treating you with such disrespect that um, if, if they're, you know, you're, it sounds like a really stuck situation and they're not getting anywhere, they're not, and you ca you can't be expected to, you know, teach them or fix it. Somebody uh, above them needs to come in. This isn't this is a institutional problem, and hmm. I just really feel for you. It, that must be hellish to be blunt. <laughs> they have to understand the dilemma that you have is when you have a system that doesn't have people with a level of understanding then they can't do it. It's like we, I dealt with something where the person was talking about gender and really understands gender, but she doesn't understand the intersection between gender and race. And so even though she's liberal and she's white, she's gonna kill off a lot of people because she doesn't get it when it comes to race. People of color don't have the luxury of doing the exact same thing that white people do. It's like, it's, you're, it's a totally different thing. My dilemma in my last job, well, the, no, not the last one, the one before my last one was, I had a boss who not only wanted to talk crazy to me and <laughs> redefine thing, words that were in the dictionary, but he want, it, I, I described it as he wanted to put a noose up, have me stand on a stool, kick the stool out from under me. Now, I know I'm going to die, and I'm prepared to do that, but he wanted to tell me how much, I was supposed to tell him how much I enjoyed it. Do you see what I'm saying? That's what gets to me. I expect you to try to kill me off. I expect you to, to you know, not tell the truth. I expect you to take a definition that's in the dictionary and redefine it 
in your church. I can deal with that, but don't ask me to love it. I will never love it for you. And that, that's what was making me ill. I said, whoa, I got to back away from here. I understand persecution, but I don't understand having to give high praise to the person who persecutes you. And then I would always say, make sure you document everything. Times, dates, incidents. So my daughter's been dying to say something. You okay, so today, um, Miss Kim, I had uh, something to say because when you're talking about first class people, this came up. Someone in my classroom, a, bo a boy, he was white, and he said, oh, I'm a first class person, so I can ride on the bus. I don't have to work. I can sit on my bottom and let second class person work for me. And he said, oh, I feel so bad for, I feel so bad for second class people because they have to work. And, I, and if I was back in the day, I would have to make them work. And I said, that's kind of racist. And he, and he said, oh, no, it's, no, no, it's not racist. It's just that they have to go out work and do the con fields and all that. And I thought that was really, really racist. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we have time for one last question because then we want to ask uh, people to kind of reflect on, it's fine to talk about it, but I'd like for people to reflect on what can you do from this day forward to try to get us out of this. It's going to take people who are allies, who understand, to try to educate the system. The people who don't understand are not in this room. And in some instances, we as people of color can't even broach it so we're dependent upon white allies to raise the question. I'm sorry, Miss. I, I don't know your name. Samaya. Samaya? Hi, Samaya. Thanks for giving us that story. Um, I, as your mom, I'm sure you've told your mom she's probably working with you. But girl, do not let up on that. Find an adult, an ally that you have, your mom, us, someone. But I want to thank you for being able to share that with us. Because at the end of the day, we're all here for you. And that's the bottom line. Um, and if there's anything else that we can do, I know you didn't get a chance to ask that, you let us know. Strong. Yeah, we have it, folks. A baby that got us uh, 10 years old and already has a habit of getting used to things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. And that to me is criminal. Right. It's absolutely criminal. Right. Our babies are walking around in a school where they're systematically getting dehumanized. Right. They're not validated. That to me, I, I, I can't wrap my, hand around, my head around that. Mm -hmm. um, which is part of my question is as a, a new educator um, who, let's be honest, is on probationary terms. Does want to, does speak out sometimes, mm -hmm. and does get that reprimand of um, what you just said and what you're feeling. You're not allowed to feel that. Right. You're wrong for feeling that. So my question becomes: How do you do that in a way that exudes compassion, that beseeches the reasons you got into the game, but also validates the other person's considerations, and still is honest, like Angela Davis said. Yes, I'm angry. My house has been getting bombed. I've been at war all my life. So yes, I am <laughs> angry when I come at you like this. Um, so my question is, is how, how did you all contend with that when you first got in? Was there as much pushback against that? Um, and do you feel like that has gotten any easier for new educators that we're trying to get in that are educators of color, people of color trying to get in the system? OK, so I'm going to start with mine. And my first advice would be, um, is to keep it real, that um, there's some things you just can't say. Mm -hmm. As a probationary, mm -hmm. you go in there making too much noise, you're going to be probationary at the unemployment line. <laughs> um, so you know the truth. You can drop little hints. You can say little things. But I would hold it until after your third year. Be strategic about it. Be strategic. <laughs> and we have had to be, that's who we are as people. 
we were singing down on the plantation. We were singing how we gonna escape tonight at sunfall, and and we were you know we were singing the song right in front of the the master. So we are strategic people, and we need to always remember mm -hmm. that that they're gonna get rid of you. You just yeah. start talking right. too much. So the real thing to do is to bide your time. It's just two years. They've been racist for a whole long time, long, long time. And so really, you know these people, you can have little conversations with them, but the best thing probably to do is to kind of bide your time. And like I said, well, except non-closure, opportunity's gonna present itself for you to remember, document and say, I remember on this day you said this, this and that, and I wanted to talk to you more about that. So it's gonna come around. It seems like three years is a long time just a drop in the hat. But, but I just cost. Right, but I disagree. I disagree because it doesn't matter with you in your first year, second year, yeah, third year, four, fifth, six. I mean, I feel like I have moved around a lot in the system because I would interrupt, 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 interrupt. And I would just like be, we're not going to continue your contract. Well, that's fine. I'm just going to move somewhere else where somebody's going to listen to me. So I just kept moving and moving and moving and moving. I've been all over the place. Did it change? And I'll tell that? you, well, no, but I stayed here. Do you know what happened? You know, I, here I, I have a doctor, I have the letters that I supposedly am supposed to have on the other side of my name because somebody told me I needed to have those in order to move up in my profession, mm -hmm. right? So I can't get a job as an administrator in Portland Public Schools because I was told we just don't move people like you forward. We don't take a gamble on a person like you. Why don't you tell me a little bit more about that, right? Why don't you take a gamble on people like me? There's a policy in Portland Public Schools that you need more people like me blowing it up, right? Blow it up. But remember, while you're blowing it up, don't run away while the fire is flaming. You know, you got to have people around you that support you and love you and say, OK, right, how can I help you fuel these flames, right? Get allies. You have to get Make allies, lots of friends. But the thing that you're going to have to deal with is you have to build a reputation right. beyond Portland Public Schools. Right, agreed. You will not be able to survive if you're in Portland Public Schools and trying to spread your wings. Right. You have to have allies outside the district and other places, and you cannot define yourself as, I am Portland Public Schools all the way. No, you're, you work at Portland Public Schools, but you have a commitment that goes beyond those boundaries. Mm -hmm. And right. it's those people outside and other places at the university, and other places who can put in a good word for you. Because bottom line is, they do. They mark you from the beginning. And uh, you'll never go anywhere <laughs> unless it's by accident. It never gets better. You just learn to maneuver better, and you learn who you can trust. And you pick out people, and you say, hey, I need to talk to you about x, y, or z. Right. I say it all the time, Jody, get your people. Because right. she's my partner in the work. Right. Get your people. And, and the meeting that uh, Corrine was just talking about, there was a white man sitting in the meeting. I said, they can't hear Paula. They can hear you as a white man yep. advocating for your child. Uh, they can uh, hear you where I can't say it. They can't hear me. So that's what we need allies. So get your ally for the next year or so right. and drop some subtle hints. Right. But yeah, if you got a mortgage, I had a mortgage when I got into teaching. Yeah. And so I couldn't be too crazy. I had two babies to feed. Right. So I couldn't be too crazy, but I seen it. Oh, trust, I've seen it. And any time I have an opportunity, because I, like I said, I believe opportunity will present itself. Right. Any time I have an opportunity, I nuzzle up to people. Hey, do you remember such and such? And have a conversation. Right. I mean, and it's, it, you know, it's interesting because today I had a conversation with a principal of color, and um, we talked about our children who are in the system that constantly on a daily, sometimes on a daily basis or every year, you have to go in and have that conversation with the teacher or the staff on how to teach your child or how to address, you know, racism. So we work for the district and we have some of the same issues with our kids that are in the system that a lot of folks of color who are not district employees have with the district. So the nice thing about you know, being inside the district is being able to address that and, and, and talk about it and point it out because a lot of times, well, I'm not gonna say a lot, sometimes folks are willing to listen to us more so than someone from the outside. Does that make sense? Right. No, mm -hmm. it does, it does. So, um, you know, just know it's not isolated and it's, you know, it happens to all of us. <laughs>
I was just gonna say, you know, it's crazy when um, getting fired from a job means you're doing the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, um, but yeah, I mean, you gotta maneuver. Did that help? Did that help at all? It did. It, it gave some good perspectives about how people it, have dealt with relationships. It happens at every level. Jaime yeah. Escalante, oh, the teacher who did all that great work, they tried to kill him. I mean, people who have done great, phenomenal things, you don't know the hell they go through. It never ends. If you're trying to change a system that is racist, it never ends. And you get a really great program, and then you get defunded. You know right. what I'm saying? We know that right. it works, right. that kind of thing. So um, we really need you to fill out the evaluations, if you could take at least one message from here. We really do need to reinvent our institution. So he gets fired, and to the extent that we are not <laughs> able to function in the organization, we need to reinvent ourselves so that we can have the impact that we want to have. People are always going to say, well, I don't like the way you said it or whatever, but we need to be strategic because in the end, we don't want to win just a battle. We want to win the war. Right. I want to see a school system where at every level, you see all kinds of people, people who are different, people who don't come from the same neighborhood, people who have high positions and actually live in the Portland Public School area, and so they have a vested interest in our children being successful. And wherever we find talent, talent is not defined by your job title. We have extremely gifted people who work in this district whose title would not grant them you know, permission to enter the King's or Queen's Chambers. But we have to recognize that every Portland Public School employee has something to put on the table that's worthwhile. We also need to call one another as we see people going down the wrong path and getting bitter or getting ill from, from having all those microaggressions. Help them. Right. Help them. If they're still getting a check from Portland Public Schools and they're having a bad year, help them. Right. Because we need all hands on deck, all feet engaged, all brains engaged. It's been my pleasure to work with these panelists. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, because I really want to see change. And I really do believe the people in this room, if you just went out and over the next three or four months, try to expand that circle of people so that they understand it's us. We are it. It's not, the system will not change unless the people within the system are able to understand what the issues are and not be afraid of somebody being too controversial. Well, that person's too controversial. No, they've got a message. You may not like the way they deliver it, but if they've got a mess message, they've got a message. I can learn from people I, that I would consider enemy. If they say something profound that will help us move forward, then I'm on it. Right. You know, So I hope that we can play it, pay it forward in terms of getting the message out to more people and reinventing this institution so that all kinds of people at all kinds of levels are moving us to get rid of this racism. It hurts everybody. Yeah. It hurts everybody. Until we can make it safe for everybody, none of us is safe. That's right. Mm -hmm. So I would like, okay. I would like to thank our panelists for coming back. Um, I appreciate your stories. I appreciate um, the information that you guys have given us tonight. Um, I really want to appreciate Carolyn for coming back. Um, it has just been an honor um, since I've been working at the district. I, she's always been my um, go-to person. She's a person that I know um, I can go to and will get the truth no matter um, what it may look like. Um, she's the person who if I'm you know, doing something incorrectly, I can go to her and she's gonna call me out on it. And she's just an all-around, honest, upfront, genuine person. And um, I have to say, I, I really miss you being here. Yeah. Um, I miss that door <laughs> not being open. I know, I know, but I- children are here, I have to fight the battle. And for every other child, I don't want any more for my great-grandchildren than I want for every other student right. in Portland Public Schools. Every student who deserves to feel welcome, wanted, and worthy of the best education we can give. And we can only give that education if we are together right. in terms of calling one another out and making sure that our families and our right. children are taken care of. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you, so, thank you guys for coming out.